Nate and some other things in the book believe that Epaph- Epaphras was the one who started this congregation. As he also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. So it seems plausible that he was the one who uh, established this congregation. And then chapter 2 and verse 1, he says, For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have, have not seen my face in the flesh. So those are just a couple reasons why we think Paul <clears throat> didn't have anything to do with the establishment of this congregation. Uh, this seems to be a predominantly Gentile congregation, chapter 1, verse 27, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So if you have some of these congregations that are like that, that are largely Jewish, and then maybe what we call half and half, Jewish Gentile, and then predominantly Gentile congregations. Um, It's interesting to note that this book, the book of Colossians, or the letter to the church at Colossae, is closely linked to uh, Philemon. So a couple of things there. Look at chapter 4, Colossians 4. And uh, in fact, I'm going to go ahead and have my Bible open to Philemon too. Colossians 4, 7 through 9, it says, All my state shall Tychicus declare unto you, who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant of the Lord, or in the Lord, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that he might know your estate and comfort your hearts with Onesimus. Okay, so Onesimus is a primary character, or I'm not crazy about that word, uh, individual in the book of Philemon. Anyway, with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you, they shall make known unto you all things which are done here. And then you look over at uh, Philemon chapter 1, and you have, um, obviously, Philemon mentioned. um, And, well, the first two verses there. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother unto Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow laborer. He talks about Aphia and Archippus. We read about them in the book of Colossians as well, um, in Colossians 4, 17, but also Onesimus. I mean, he's, like I said, he is part of the account, part of this letter from Paul to Philemon. Onesimus, do any of you know who he was in relation to Philemon? He's his slave, his servant. Apparently he had run off, but while he was gone, he encountered Paul, was uh, was baptized into Christ, and Paul sent him back to Philemon. So it's just interesting to note those connections between the the various books of the Bible. Um, Colossians is unique. It's, well, one of the things, and I put this in your outline, and we'll deal with this when we get there, but Colossians and Ephesians are called the twin epistles because they're so closely related in subject matter, but um, one of the features of Colossians is that it deals very particularly with um, certain doctrines. So before we get to those four bullet points there, I want to look at that paragraph that I have in there. Because of Gnosticism, all, the word all, is kind of the main theme in Colossians. The word all is used 32 times in just four chapters. There's something to that. Um, So this word Gnostic, we need to know what that means, comes from the Greek word ginosko, which means knowledge or to know something. And these Gnostics, and it it really came on later in the first century. Um, We see this throughout like 1 John, particularly Colossians. But they claim to have special knowledge about a variety of things and that Christians were kind of in the dark in certain realms, and that if you're, if you're going to be all you can be, then you need the knowledge that these Gnostics had. And so um, as you read through Colossians, you're going to see, again, this word all 32 times, but it's in a variety of ways. Um, so, for instance, Colossians 1, and uh, we're not going to read all this, but verses 9 through 11, he prays for their knowledge, um, the knowledge of his will in all wisdom 
and spiritual understanding. Well, the Gnostics are telling them you don't have all the knowledge that you need in terms of your wisdom and spiritual understanding. Um, well, they did. And then he says in verse 10, that you may walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. You can be fully pleasing to God with the knowledge that you have. So Gnosticism is, and it, it shows up in a variety of ways. Um, we'll talk about that here in just a minute. But uh, that's, a, that's a big theme in the book of Colossians. So let's talk about these various problems facing this church. Um, number one, Judaism. Obviously, that's a main theme throughout most of your New Testament letters. Uh, Colossians 2. I don't want to read all of these, but if somebody would read Colossians 2. Make it just 14 through 17, please. Somebody read that. Okay, so we know he's talking about Judaism here because of those last two verses. The festivals, the new moons, the Sabbaths, and those things are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance or the fullness is in Christ. And, you know, you think of like the book of Hebrews, and it talks about the superiority of the new law as opposed to the old law and things like this. But he tells them there in verse 16, let no one judge you. Well, what does that mean? Well, the idea is don't let anybody particularly the, the Judaizing teachers, impose their religion on you. Now, he's going to talk about self-imposed religion here a little bit later in chapter 2, and we'll get to that. But um, that stuff's been blotted out. You Look at, again, verse 14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances which was against us. Now, if you're looking at a King James, you have that word ordinances. The New King James uses the word requirements. The handwriting of requirements. And it's an interesting word in the original language. It's the word dogma. You've heard the word dogmatic or dogmas, and it has the idea of doctrines and decrees. Well, what was it that Jesus took out of the way and nailed to his cross? The old law. It was the, as Paul said, and in fact, this is one of the parallels between Colossians and Ephesians. It was that handwriting of ordinances. Um, the, the table of commandments, things like this. So Judaism was affecting this church. Don't let anybody impose that on you. A second thing is mysticism. Somebody read Colossians 2.18. Okay. Looking into those things which they have not seen... Um, uh, voluntary humility, King James. New King James says false humility. They have this special knowledge, okay? That they've seen into things that nobody else has seen, so they will, they will um, it's kind of like the idea of self-deprecation, put themselves down falsely to cause themselves to appear, um, I guess you might say, more important than they really are. Well, don't let anybody beguile you. Don't let them cheat you out of what you have in Christ based on something that they claim they have. So mysticism, all right? Um, asceticism, it's an interesting word. Anybody know what asceticism is? What that refers to? It's basically the denial of the flesh. One of the doctrines, and we'll get to that in a minute here with more of the, the Gnostics, is that Essentially, you have two realms of existence that are wholly separate. You have the flesh and the spirit. The flesh is wholly, purely evil. And the spirit is totally free from the influence of that evil in the flesh. That's why, well, that's one of the reasons why in the book of Colossians, we're told that in Christ, all the fullness of the Godhead dwelt bodily. There, there was a group of, and I can't remember the names, there were a couple of different groups of Gnostics based on a person that they followed. Um, but they said that Jesus and Christ were two different entities. 
And that when Jesus went to the cross, the Christ left. I mean, there are, there are all kinds of interesting doctrines that, well, interesting, false, but it's, it's kind of interesting to know, let me say it that way. But asceticism, because the flesh is evil, well, you have to punish the flesh. You might think of something along the lines of like, um, um, like a monk living in solitary, just living all by himself to deny the, um, you might say, the pleasures of the flesh or the benefits of fleshly things. So Colossians 2, beginning in verse 20, he says, If you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are you subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not. Stay away from these certain things, which all are to perish with the using. You know, why, why do we use things in this world? Why do we eat? Well, it's for the benefit of the body. Why do we clothe ourselves? Well, it's for the benefit of the body. But if you're, if you're an ascetic, if you believe in asceticism, you've got to deny the body because the flesh is wholly evil. Paul says these things perish with the using. But it's after the commandments and doctrines of men, the end of verse 22 says, so stay away from that which things have indeed a show of wisdom in the King James says will worship in verse 23, and the New King James says self-imposed religion. It's the idea there. Same concept. You worship according to your will. Um, self-imposed worship, will worship, and humility, and neglecting of the body. There's your key. That's asceticism. Denying the body because it's evil. Not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. You can't indulge in anything fleshly because the flesh is wholly evil. So that was something that was um, troubling the church in Colossae. Now, this idea that the body, that the flesh is evil and that the spirit is not and can't be corrupted by the flesh. You know, there, there are still people who believe that today, um, even in the use the term loosely, even in the Christian world, that you can commit sin. If you're a Christian, you can live in sin and it won't affect your soul. Um, well, you might read Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? What was his answer? Absolutely not. It, you don't... God's grace and, and forgiveness of sins is not licensed to do whatever you want to do. So, um, well, let's look at the next one here. Dualism or Gnosticism. And that's, this is more in, in relation to Christ and certain teachings about Him. Somebody read Colossians 2 verse 9, please. Okay, now if you look at the verse right before that, verse 8, he talks about them being spoiled through philosophy and vain deceit. Well, that's that teaching of dualism. The, the, and, and specifically in regard to Jesus as the Christ, it's the tradition of men, it's a rudiment of the world, and it's not after Christ because he was the fullness of the Godhead in body, in bodily form. And so this idea that the flesh is evil and that, that Jesus and the Christ were two different entities is, well, it's completely wrong. And notice there in verse 9, it's your key word. For in Him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. Um, Jesus was, you know, we use this, or we hear this word, incarnate, incarnation, um, God in the flesh. That's who He was. And there was a doctrine in the first century that was denying that. Uh, like I said, the book of 1 John deals with that too. Um, the, the Antichrist that's mentioned in 1 John denied that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. And 2 John deals with that too. So that was a prevalent teaching. And that, that teaching actually went on into church history. Um, and even some of those early church councils, 3rd, 4th, 5th century, still were Striving with that teaching of the, the dual nature of Christ. Well, if you believe, if you're, if you're a dualist, 
you believe that the flesh is holy evil and the spirit's holy good. So you can't then reconcile Jesus Christ. You, you, you can't, you couldn't conceive of the idea of God being in the flesh because flesh is evil. And so that was, that was part of their problem that they were struggling with and that was, or that they were denying, but that was challenging the church at Colossae. And that's, that's his point right there in Colossians 2 and verse 9. The flesh is not evil. We are not inherently evil. You and I are not born with a sinful nature. You know, there are a lot of people who believe that, that we're born. Um, a typical phrase would be something along the lines of totally depraved, born in sin, born with a sinful nature, all those different phrases we still hear today. That's what these people were teaching then. The flesh is evil, so how then could the Christ be Jesus? How could the Christ take on flesh since flesh is evil? Well, that's the point. Flesh is not evil. You know, when, when God created Adam and Eve in the garden, how were they created? In the image of God and in His likeness, Genesis 1, 26 and 27. When, does, when did that stop? When did humans stop being in the image of God? Well, they didn't. God is the one who gives the Spirit. Um... You know, I think of passages like Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 7 talking about death, but he says that the body will return to the dust and the spirit will return to God who gave it. Well, if God gives you your spirit, then how could you be born sinful? Because then that would be, his, that would be on him, wouldn't it? He, if, he give, if, if he's the source of life and gives, and gives you the, the seed of life and that's when it begins... And if you're sinful, that's on God, not on Adam, as most people say. We inherit our sinful nature from Adam. No, it has to start with God because he's the, well, it's like Hebrews 12 and verse 9 says, he's the father of spirits. So if you're sinful, if your spirit's sinful, then that's on God. And that's, uh, you know, who wants to take that position? Any questions or comments on any of that? That's exactly right. Um, you know, I, one of the passages I think of is, I'll put it in the form of a question. How, how are people told they need to be in order to enter the kingdom of heaven? What do they like, be, need to be like? Like little children. Well, what does that mean? If, if, and here's the thing. Um, those folks who believe that, that you're born with a sinful nature, and that's just every human, you're totally corrupt, wholly unable to do any good, okay? Then why in the world would Jesus say, why would he predicate entrance into the kingdom upon being like a little wicked sinner? I heard one, um, I heard one, he's a reformed theologist, but he was talking about children, and he he said, uh, I forget how he said it. He made it rhyme. He said something, but then he, he said, they're not that. Babies are vipers and diapers. You know, you, and you think about that logic. Why do you think we have infant baptism? Because those little vipers are sinners and they need to be saved as close to birth as possible. You know, infant baptism, sprinkling most of the time. It's not even baptism. Um, but that goes back to this belief that the flesh is wholly evil. Um, but yeah, Timber's right. Y name any sin, you know, whether it's homosexuality or, or whatever sin you want to list. That's on God because God is the father of your spirit and he gives the spirit. So that's a, that's a pretty serious charge to me. There are certain passages that they will use, Romans 3.23 being one, all have sinned and are, have come short of the glory of God. A primary passage is Psalm 51.5. Psalm 51.5, Psalm 51, 
Somebody turn over there and read that for us, please. Psalm 51.5. I tell you what, does somebody Google this verse, get your phone out, and do search Psalm 51.5 in the New International Version and read that for us. But somebody else read it right now in the King James. Okay, does anybody have it on the NIV yet? Psalm 51.5. Yes, sir. Listen to this now, pay attention. Did you all hear that? I was sinful from birth. Sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Now read it again, Jeff, in the, in the King. That is two completely different readings. It's not even close to the same. Sinful from the time my mother conceived me. You know, we talk about, you know, life beginning at conception. And that version that Joe read from says that, well, you're sinful from conception. Who gives you your soul at, con uh, at concept conception? God. So if you're sinful from that point, that's on God. But here's what we need to understand. Psalm 51.5 was not written by David to prove that everybody's born a sinner. I mean, that's anti-biblical from Genesis to Revelation, but that's not why he's writing. If you look at Psalm 51.5, he is expressing um, extreme guilt and remorse over his sin with Bathsheba. He's doing it in poetic, uh, in a poetic genre, but it's figurative language, okay? So let me show you. Well, let me get there. Psalm 51.5, it'd be nice if I were there. Um, is that in the Old Testament? Give me just a minute. Let, let, <laughs> listen to some of these other verses. Uh, verse 7, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Is that literal? Can you literally take a bath and be white as snow? I'm pretty white, okay? I've never been as white as snow. Um, verse 8, make me, to hear, make me to hear joy and gladness and the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Did David have broken bones? No, he's poetically expressing his regret and remorse over sin. He's not making some argument for a sinful nature. You know, that's why it's important that, you know, when you talk about looking at Bibles and getting certain Bibles, there are certain passages that you can look at. If you know, I want to stay away from that version because it just teaches something completely false. Anyway, any questions or comments on all of that? Okay, that's good. A beautiful psalm of repentance that includes poetic, hyperbolic language. Do any of you know what a hyperbole is? Or what hyperbole is? Exaggeration for emphasis. And that's why he talks about broken bones. And that's why he talks about being washed so he can be whiter than snow. That's no more literal than... Him being born, born, conceived, well, how does it say it? Um, in sin, my mother conceived me. He's not literally talking about his soul's condition at birth. He's exaggerating the situation to emphasize his remorse over the sin he committed with Bathsheba. But when you get to Gnosticism, when you get to Calvinism, Reformed theology, the flesh is wholly evil. There's nothing you can do. If you're going to be saved, God has to work a miracle on you. He has to send His Holy Spirit to change your very nature, change you to the core. And yet we still have Matthew 18, 3 that says, if you want to enter into the kingdom of heaven, you need to be like these little children. So explain that rift if, the, if, if sinful nature is true. Well, it's not.
Well, it's, it's, and it's not necessarily, you know, we're not given the details of David's conception and birth, but it's the concept of the environment in which he was brought, into which he was brought, let's say. It, it's been illustrated in the past, um, replacing the words, I was brought forth, I heard one preacher do it like this, I was brought forth in a, what was it, a potato patch, and in a potato patch my mother conceived me. It, it's the environment into which he was brought in the world, but he's, again, that's, it's not to be taken literally like that because it's poetic hyperbole. He's exaggerating the case to make his point of regret over sin. Any other questions or comments on that? Uh -huh. Huh. Job cared for the orphans and widows since he had been since he was born. Well, that's hyperbole. You know, it, and we say things like that. I've done this my whole life. You know, Mar Marvin was on the train for his whole life. Well, when did you you didn't start when you were freshly hatched, were you? <laughs> I mean, we even use hyperbole like that uh, to make a point. So that's what we have there in Psalm 51. Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly right. So anyway, back to Colossians. These Christians, this congregation was being faced with this doctrine that said your flesh is wholly evil and your spirit is wholly good. And so Jesus, the man, couldn't be the Christ. It, he could not be. And... This, like I said, this doctrine is it, it's primarily later in the first century, but it goes on into the second, third, fourth centuries. And even some church councils in, in those periods of time dealt with that doctrine. But Colossians destroys that doctrine. There's, you cannot separate the flesh from the soul and the effects of one on the other. Okay? All right. All uh, right. Well, let's deal with this real quick. Colossians and Ephesians being twin letters, twin epistles. So, for instance, in Ephesians 1, 19 through 23, we're not going to read all of these verses, but just make some um, notation here, you might say. Paul, this is part of Paul's prayer for the church at Ephesus. Talks about the position of Christ, you might say, raised from the dead, seated at the right hand of the Father, in the heavenly places, far above all principalities and powers and dominion. And then you get to Colossians chapter 1, and you start reading, for instance, in verse 15 about Jesus. He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by Him were all things created that are in heaven and on earth. And you have Him over all the thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers. And He is before all things, and by, all things, by Him all things consist. Or they're upheld. Um, the, the idea of the law of Moses being taken away and nailed to his cross. Ephesians 2, 11 through 15. Colossians 2, 11 through 17. We've already read that part of that passage, so we won't do that again. But it says the same thing. And these congregations are... The letters were written at different times and obviously different locations. Um, Ephesians 4, 17 to 32. And Colossians 3, 5 through 17. You have this... Uh, Old man versus new man. Things to put off versus things to put on. And it's just like a parallel account. Reading the same thing. You know, and that's one thing that we learn from Scripture. God's truth applies across the board. It's like when Paul was talking about his... Um, well, when he was talking about the contribution that all these different congregations were giving to the poor saints in Judea. When he writes the Corinthians, he said... As I have given order unto the churches of Galatia, even so you must do. Do it the same way they did it. You see this uniformity of doctrine in the New Testament. You don't have churches practicing and believing different things. It's the same gospel for everybody. And, you know, that's not changed. And so that's, you, you see these similarities. Um, Ephesians 5, through 6, 9. Husband-wife relationship. Parent-child relationship. And then... Um, Employer-employee relationship, as we'd say it today. Masters and servants. Colossians is rather um, 
shrunk down, you might say. It's quite a bit shorter, but it's the exact same content. Uh, so, any questions or comments on any of this? Next time you read through Colossians, and hopefully you've been doing it, it's only 95 verses, just notice how many times that word all is used. Words are not in the Bible by accident. There's something to it. And uh, they had all that they needed. In fact, look at Colossians 2 before we uh, finish up here. So the Gnostics were telling them, we know things that you don't know that you need to know. Colossians 2, 2, that their hearts might be comforted being knit together in love and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. There's no special treasure over here of information that the Gnostics have or that the dualists have or that those who practice asceticism have. You know, you Christians have got some things right, but you need to deny your body. We've got this information over here. Paul says that you, you have all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge in Christ. You're not missing anything. So that's, uh, pay, pay attention to those words. All right, anything else before we stop? Mm-hmm. How do they, yeah, those who believe that sprinkling is baptism, how do they deal with Colossians 2.12? Well, because baptism has been, over the centuries, let's say, turned into a religious rite, R-I-T-E, or a ceremony, and, we, and the term has been redefined. You know, the, the Greek term means to bury, to immerse. The English term, you look it up, it can mean to sprinkle, it can mean to pour. The English word doesn't mean what the Greek word meant. Well, yeah, and they would accept that as, yes, bar baptism is a burial, but so is sprinkling and so is pouring. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right, that's enough of that. <laughs> All right, thanks for your attention. He said we might have before we got all, didn't get all this rain. Sprinkling dirt. Yeah.